Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Rick. I'm a product owner at Springest, and I'm also the lead link of the product circle at Springest. Uh, Springest is a global marketplace for learning and professional development. And our purpose is helping people reach their full potential through learning. So <coughs> um, today I'll be talking about how we at Springest self-organize using Holacracy and how we use the OKR framework, objectives and key results, to help everyone at the company align strategically. And then specifically, I'll talk about how, uh, how we do that in our product development circle and about how that has helped us to gradually improve yeah, processes, um, teamwork, and happiness. So <clears throat> Holacracy is a framework for organizational governance that helps you achieve a decentralized type of management. Um, some call it an operating system for your organization. Um, it has helped us to create a pretty flexible organizational structure with um, yeah, high level of autonomy for, for everyone in the organization. And that includes our developers and, and product developers. So um, I'll start off by showing you something practical as context for the rest of the talk. So what you see here is a, is a snapshot of our current organizational structure. Uh, you can find this at roles.springus.com. So <clears throat> all the little dots represent um, roles with clearly defined accountabilities. And one person can hold multiple roles spread over various circles, um, which you can think of kind of as departments. So yeah, the average at Springus, at least currently, is each person holds about seven roles, for example. So this structure is for for many years now, continuously iterated through um, a holocratic governance process in which each springeteer, as we call them, uh, participates. So that goes from the, yeah, from the founder to the newest of interns, really. And so compared to an org chart at yeah, a regular type company, this is really not predefined at all and not made by upper management in a creationist sort of way. So the truth is, um, yeah, most days, something will have evolved compared to the previous day. Um, so you see this, this big circle surrounding everything. That's what we call the alignment circle. And it has the purpose helping people reach their full potential through learning, which, as I said, is the, the purpose of the entire company. So in the real world, um, this, this purpose takes the shape of a website where people who are looking for learning can browse buy, review, and interact with companies who sell learning products. So in other words, this is a marketplace. And um, these learning products you can think of, yeah, tens of thousands of group trainings, in-company trainings, e-learnings, assessments, things like that. So anything you can learn from. So learning is a pretty complex sector. And often it is, yeah, people's employers are actually paying for the learning. And especially at big companies, um, Management layers might be involved in terms of approval for, yeah, in terms of budget or career paths. So almost out of necessity, our ecosystem has come to include um, custom learning and development portals for big corporates. And then these tap back into our public marketplaces as well, which we run in various countries. So while we might have a clear purpose, we also have a very complex product. So in terms of product development, this means that, yeah, at any given moment, there are dozens of seemingly worthwhile projects that we could be doing. So the challenge there is to prioritize optimally, because, of course, you always want to be doing the most valuable thing uh, possible at any given moment. Now, such a huge challenge isn't yeah, unique to us, of course. Um, and Scrum, for example, um, the Agile methodology was was developed to help teams tackle this sort of challenge. Um, so interestingly, the Agile Manifesto even, which Scrum drew, it, drew its inspiration from, even states um, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. So it might not be a surprise when I kind of spoiler already that the, the practices that I've, have evolved for us in our product circle using Holacracy definitely have overlaps with the best practices from Scrum. Um, a key difference, though, is that in a Scrum team, self-management doesn't go beyond the team. In, um, 
You know, lacrosse, self-management is everywhere. And when done well, it is this difference that helps um, yeah, each member of the product circle, for example, to, <coughs> to, take, yeah, to, to make an impact on business decisions, roadmaps, and strategy in any part of the organization. So, <coughs> so our challenge, though, is twofold, kind of. Um, first of all, we want to do Scrum-ish product development well for a huge product. But secondly, we want each uh, yeah, circle member to feel empowered, but also to really take responsibility to do something else, whatever it is. If they sense, if they reason that this something else you know, contributes to the organization even more. And this takes yeah, a lot of practice and honest feedback, persistence, and also a certain type of person. So before I get to how we tackle these challenges, I want to give you some, some background into Holacracy and our journey with it. So on the left here, you see Ruben Timmerman, that's our founder, back in uh, October 2012, after literally signing away his CEO authority and adopting the Holacracy Constitution. And yeah, that's a thing, more on that shortly. <laughs> And on the right, you see Diederik Janssen, uh, a pioneer of holacracy in, in Holland and our coach in the process. So back then, Springest had about 15 employees, and Ruben was looking for ways to, to scale decision-making. And um, yeah, traditionally, this is when you introduce managers. But Ruben felt quite strongly that it had to be possible in another way, with yeah, spreading accountability more and people generally being happier than at the average company. Um, all of this, though, not going at the expense of having alignment throughout the company and people generally being productive. So Holacracy came onto our path, and it had the, the promise of maybe making this possible. Um, <clears throat> so basically, as developers, as product developers, this was kind of thrown at us, like deal with it. But at the same time, we were also up for it because it had the, the promise of as you scale, which it looked like we would keep on doing, to, um, yeah, to keep politics out of the company, to keep bullshitting out of the company, to keep meetings short, and generally providing or adding more clarity. So we were on board as well, to try it out at least. So Holacracy de definitely promises those things. It promises a flexible organizational structure, well, or at least to help you attain that, uh, a new f meeting format, geared towards action and eliminating over-analysis, um, more autonomy for teams and individuals, and a decision-making process, a governance process that helps you achieve those things. So it was also made clear from the start. Want a photo? Come on. <laughs> yes, nice. <laughs> you can find them on Google image search as well. <laughs> no. It was made clear from the start that uh, self-management can only exist within extreme clarity. And to achieve extreme clarity, you need a very rigid structure. Um, it can evolve over time, but at any point in time, it needs to be rigid. And Holacracy, to help you get there, has something called the, the Constitution, <laughs> which, lays out, which basically lays out the core principles and practices of the system. So that's basically what we set out to learn back in 2012 and beyond. And of course, you can't suddenly spend more than half of your time on this or something. You still have to focus mainly on the product and the services that you're building. So I'd estimate that maybe we spent 15% you know, of our time on that in the, f um, in the first, you know, first three, four, or five months. And gradually, over time, that became less and less until ideally this whole thing, um, yeah, holacracy as an operating system for your organization, is more of a, a background process. So. Holacracy has one key ingredient, and that's tension. So this word has a negative connotation in day-to-day -day life, but um, the key is to look at it in a positive way. So the, the Holacracy Constitution even defines it as um, a gap between the current reality and the potential that you sense. And, and crucially, it demands that everyone in the organization, when they, when they sense a tension, that they try to resolve it. And I think this is a very powerful, but also very logical concept, I think. Like, of course, you want to constantly improve the organization, right? But <coughs> um, I'd wager that this is also why it's so hard for companies to succeed at doing holacracy 
or probably to succeed at doing self-management more broadly because people aren't used to this in professional life, <laughs> at least. But theoretically, it could be done, um, and in practice as well as it turned out for us, at least. So I'll give you one example um, to, uh, fr from our product circle, quite recent, to, to just give you an idea of like, how this can go, this type of thing. So some colleagues, uh, and I as well, hold um, the role product owner, and as part of its accountabilities, you're, you're constantly setting up projects for new product improvements. And um, yeah, we do this in our project management tool, Asana, which if you don't know it, it's similar to Trello or Jira. Um, and he noticed how in our setup, um, yeah, our tasks would always, or often, slightly diverge from one another, you know, sometimes causing us to, to miss important things. So he felt this as a tension and acted on it. So what he did was, he governed um, a role into existence, basically, which yeah, had a, a quite simple accountability to you know, maintain a template um, that auto-creates um, yeah, a new project task list for you. And secondly, he governed onto the product owner role the accountability to, to, that you have to use this. So it's quite a simple example, um, but just to give you an example uh, or a feel for it. So, and just to, so you picture kind of how this setting is in real life, how such a process can look like. Um, the Constitution has a clear set of rules for, for, you, for how to enact the, the um, governance process in your regular meetings, which you know, can be weekly, bi-weekly. And this is a screenshot of us doing such a meeting, uh, such a governance meeting. Um, if you're interested, you can, you can find the, the video on YouTube. So the thing with this type of meeting, it's quite different from a normal meeting, let's say, at, at yeah, that people are used to and often don't like, where the loudest voice rules or where people all voice their opinions like very chaotically. Um, in, in a governance meeting, um, after a proposal, there is a, a systematic and respectful way for everyone to have a voice and to have an opportunity to object to a proposal. So the thing is, though, there is a facilitator testing objections. And basically, it, the, the core question of this testing amounts to, will this proposal um, harm us or move us backwards? And in reality, it's very difficult often for um, objections to hold. Um, and th that is, you know, because of that, you get a, lo a lot of evolution happening, a lot of testing happening. So with these rules at our disposal, um, yeah, things took shape over the years. So one, one clear advantage that Holacracy gives you is the sense of purpose that can trickle down from the company as a whole to its various circles and sub-circles. So, um, yeah, as I said, the alignment circle has the purpose helping people reach their full potential, which I'll stop saying now. Um, and here you see some other circles and their purposes. And, um, yeah, we reached the product circle with the purpose currently, um, an always improving experience for everyone on our learning platform. And actually, the product circle also has a subcircle called infrastructure, 100% um, available and performing spring of sites and services. Is it big enough? Yeah, this, this still is. <laughs> so um, yeah, also to give you an idea, zooming into the product circle, you see a whole bunch of roles. Um, yeah, it's just a snapshot to give you an idea. And uh, oh yeah, so <laughs> the, just to show you, there's actual humans behind you know, these roles. This is a. Uh, Yes, most of us in the, in, the, in the product circle on a company trip last year. So what guides these humans or roles on a day-to-day -to -day basis beyond you know, the circle's purpose? And that's another key ingredient, that's strategy. And in Holacracy, strategy is set by the lead link of a circle, which for the product circle, um, as I said, that's me. So there is a bit of a, a myth that there is no hierarchy in self-organization. There definitely is, at least in, in Holacracy. So it's just that the, the powers are much more distributed. So a lead link does, let's say, I think about 25% of what a, a traditional manager does. But it is the most important, I think, again, 25%. It's one, um, setting strategy or relative priorities. It's two, uh, defining metrics. And three, allocating resources which means you know, asking someone to fill a role if it is created or 
when someone is on holiday or something like finding a backup or serving as a backup yourself. So the other 75%, at least in, in time, let's say, which is often, you know, uh, micromanaging, making micro decisions, um, yeah, getting things checked off, that's just not part of it. So as a lead link of the product circle, for example, I spend on average maybe two, um, yeah, a couple hours a week on that role, on average. Um, <clears throat> but, well, some math. Uh, <laughs> There, but it is an important, those couple hours are important, setting strategy are important. And we do that by defining OKRs, objectives and key results. So um, generally we set OKRs every quarter, uh, though there's nothing telling you you can't do it more or less frequently, but that's about a good time frame. Um, so this framework dictates kind of that objectives should be qualitative, ambitious and inspirational, time bound and actionable. And the key results hanging under an objective um, should be measurable. They should lead to objective grading. And they should, should be difficult to achieve, but not impossible. And when you, um, when you do that well, this, this should help you to focus on that which is important over that which is urgent. So yeah, to, to show you how that looks like in practice for us. Um, and I realize this is all small in these types of slides. Um, but I'll just narrate, yeah, it's not, it's not about the details. But so this is uh, Asana, as I said, our project management tool, also our personal task management tool, but we also use it to log our OKRs and also to log our holocratic structure. So this, though, is called the OKR overview, and you see top, um, top left, the current OKRs at Springest, currently, and the one in red is the one for the alignment circle, and the objective is, um, I'll read it out, leads versus bookings, the flipping happens. Um, so the, the, I won't go into why that makes sense for us at the moment. Um, if you're interested, talk to me after. But just wanted to show you, you know, how we do it. And on, on the right, you see some background. And then um, um, bottom right, you see some key results that hang, hang under this. So I'll read one out again. 625 bookable providers in NL with complete prices and starting dates. And there's a, a number at the end which serves as the baseline that we measured at the beginning of the quarter. So you can, yeah, you can evaluate throughout the quarter how you're doing. So um, then as lead link of the product circle, I set about also uh, defining some objectives and key results of my own, inspired by the uh, OKRs of the alignment circle. And again, won't go into them, just showing you, yeah, that they are there. <laughs> um, so, what I'll, um, after setting su such strategy, um, what I'll do, or what any circle at Springers will do, is communicating the, the OKRs uh, company-wide. So um, this is, you know, we do that on our internal message board, and that's a, yeah, really a nice opportunity for everyone in, in the circle, but also just everyone at, in other circles or outside, uh, yeah, just everyone at Springers, to get an idea of what's going on, to join in a discussion, and to really also critically feedback these OKRs and they can still evolve a bit, like nothing is set in stone. Um, another thing that will probably happen is that, um, yeah, the, the metrics that you are measuring might evolve. You know, like if you're focusing on a particular new um, thing, new objective, then maybe some metric that you weren't focusing on before now becomes important. So this is a screenshot of our big, uh, yeah, KPI document, we call it, with a whole bunch of sheet, uh, sheets, for one for each circle. And yeah, recently this evolved a bit, so that, that happens a lot as well. So <clears throat> now then, how do you tackle, actually tackle this objective and get to those key results? So as I talked about earlier, we're a pretty complex product with years of built up feedback from, from uh, customers and users and uh, colleagues. Um, so how do we bring order in this? Well, the starting point is not very surprising. <laughs> it's a, yeah, a list called, we call it future product projects. Um, that's basically endless. Um, so what has evolved is one important role that we call, that is called the, the prio role. Um, so it has the purpose, uh, max a maximized potential impact of products resources all of the time. Um, so this role is actually very analogous to the product owner role in, in Scrum. Uh, it's accountable for setting relative priority on what things to tackle next. Um, so there are multiple people holding a prior role, uh, and what these roles, 
oh, this wasn't supposed to be like that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you anyway. Damn. Um, <laughs> so what these roles do together, in the background, there's, a, there's a, an overview of our product projects. Damn, that's annoying. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll stop that. Um, sorry. Um, so these these prior roles, the, the prior role is held by multiple people, and together they make sure that there is a bunch of uh, projects to pick from for the developer uh, role, which there exists as well, and that's held by multiple uh, people. I'll show you that now. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, you can't see it now in the background, but there's a list of projects that are currently in Prio, and a bunch of them are picked up currently by uh, the developers, uh, the developer role, and a bunch of them are up for grabs, as we say. So the, 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 the Prio role together, the Prio role holders always make sure that there's a pool of projects to pick from. Um, so one important thing that has evolved, that's pr uh, j not just in the product circle, but also in um, uh, in product uh, in Spring as a whole, is uh, it's a policy also made through holocratic governance. Is that each project must have a why now? So a why now is a bit of text that explains not just why it's a good idea to do a, a project, this project, but especially why now. And um, ideally, it also links it back to a currently active OKR. So as a developer, when you're browsing through this pool of projects, which you can't see, <laughs> um, you can check out these why nows and see which, one you, which project you feel you can contribute to best. No, now we can see it. Wow. OK. <laughs> so we see the, the open projects there. Um, so now suppose, though, that you don't want to work on a project at the moment. You want to mix things up a bit and do something smaller. So we have one. Uh, other main place that we work from called the non-project prio list. Not a great name, but yeah. Um, so this is basically a pool of, of tasks that are a bit smaller, you know, like bugs and, and small improvements. Um, and so the question is, how do we keep filling up this list and the, the project list as well in a way that fits strategy? So um, the developer role, as I said, is held, uh, the prior role, as I said, is held by multiple people. And that's because our product is yeah, quite big and complex. It would be too much for one person to, to own the whole thing, of course. So that's not very surprising as well. So Holacracy allows for something that it calls focus. Um, so, and uh, it says that the delete link can put uh, a particular focus on a role um, if it, the role is held by multiple people. So we have prior roles with focuses that are kind of based on other circles in the company. So we have a prior role with the focus provider circle. Uh, providers, in this case, is the, the, the supply side of the marketplace. Uh, a, fo a, a prior role with the focus user circle, a prior role with the focus organization circle, and so on. Um, another thing that has evolved, though, is um, some, some focuses that aren't uh, specifically tied to another circle, but there uh, there are areas of interest nonetheless. So one of them is security, uh, another one is technical improvement, under which we bundle, yeah, you know, tasks like uh, things to do with with exceptions, you know, refactoring, bigger architectural changes. And the cool thing is, some of these prior roles are held by people who self-identify mainly as de uh, developers. And conversely, each of our product owner uh, people have at times also held the developer role. So it's kind of yeah, it's just about how can each person contribute best at, at that moment in time. So as a lead link, I can set strategy by setting relative priority. And in the product circle, I take this quite far by um, setting a relative resource distribution available per focus for these prior roles. So again, sorry it's small, but I'll just read out. Um, currently, this, the prior role with the provider circle focus has 30% available uh, you know, resource. 
and user circle 10%, technical improvement 15%, and so on. And so what this means, now going back to this list of you know, smaller tasks, but also to this pool of projects, is that you know, over time, roughly, th um, suppose uh, you know, the one with 30% uh, resource, over time, roughly three out of 10 tasks that are processed out of this list, that are shipped, um, sh should have that focus. Yeah? So over time, we also build up some statistics um, and, uh, on this, you know, how many tasks or projects were th which were shipped uh, per focus. And you can kind of study if reality you know, ended up being like you, like you strategized or like you predicted. If not, you know, uh, that's, that's okay. You can learn from that. And also reality changes things sometimes. So of course, one thing that will happen as well is that you know, as new strategy is set, so especially when new OKRs are set, uh, um, it might make sense to change this resource distribution. It might suddenly, you know, something that has 30% before uh, can have less or more. It might make sense for that to happen. So let's tie it back together. Um, how does actual day-to-day -day execution of a project go? Um, so let's take a random project from this pool of projects. Um, I'll just read out. So this, this project is called, has a title, or actually, as we call it, an outcome start date importer live in the admin. Okay? And... Um, so, as I said, this has a clearly defined why now, um, and that refers back to an OKR. And uh, yeah, as a product owner, I can quickly generate this, this uh, list of tasks for this project using this, this template that I talked about before, maintained by that role that I, that I talked about in the beginning. So, um, in general, our proj projects have three phases. Uh, first, we call preparation phase, in which mockups are, are Mockups and, and requirements or visual designs are, are made, and you know feedback goes back and forth. We go to the development phase where uh, coding is done and testing is done, and you know it can go into the continuous deployment funnel. And we have a rollout phase where, um, yeah, announcements are made or internal documentation is made, analytics reports are made. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if this is very different from how other organizations or teams do it. To me, it sounds very logical. So, you know, I went through it quite quickly. Um, but, but what I do know is that however obvious it might be, uh, our process was less efficient half a year ago and less efficient half a year ago before that. Uh, and therefore, less fun, I think, at least. Uh, so, what, so, cause these, so these, these things change in little steps as you encounter new suboptimalities, new, new challenges. You know, as you grow also, you might have bigger customers and just new things happen. And Holacracy enables us to quite quickly also, you know, map the things that we learn into our organizational uh, structure. So in that sense, Holacracy, the, the Holacracy framework has helped us to double down really on the Kaizen mindset, which we were pretty big on even before we knew about Holacracy. So Kaizen is um, Japanese for continuous improvement. Uh, it, it, it was introduced as a lean business process at Toyota after the Second World War and it grew, you know, throughout the world afterwards. Um, yeah. So still, though, all of this, what I'm talking about, sounds quite rigid, you know, resource distribution, pool of projects and tasks. It's not pure assignment, but it's also not endless freedom, uh, you know, and choices. Well, that's what we were told in the beginning. To achieve extreme clarity, you need a very rigid structure. Um, and we found that to be true in how our product circle's governance has evolved uh, naturally. Still though, how much self-organizing is left then? Well, first of all, just because something gets prior doesn't mean priority, doesn't mean that that can't change. Um, you know, so, so holacracy done well has sort of um, what I call an, an inbuilt, uh, a built-in safeguard against the sunk cost fallacy. Just because you decided something uh, to start something doesn't mean that it can't be stopped. And in that sense, um, holacracy is more like Kanban, another lean methodology, than like Scrum, in which, you know, in Scrum, if, you, if you, a sprint has started, the sprint goal can't be changed. That's the rules. <laughs> um, so, secondly, though, in our product circle, more roles have uh, evolved over time as well. It's not just this, you know, the, the prior role and the developer role and the product owner role that I uh, was talking about. Uh, thirdly, all of my colleagues, including myself, also hold roles in other circles in Springest. So, um, some examples. Uh, GDD coach, 
evangelism, recruiting, office design. So each day, it is really up to each individual to choose their own priorities, given all the rule, um, roles that they hold, and to evaluate how they can best contribute to the, you know, the OKRs everywhere at the company. Um, so one, one cool example is, uh, is, one, is a recent example, a developer colleague of mine Recently, he identified like a giant learning opportunity for a whole bunch of people in another circle at Springest who are you know, ca calling users a lot to help them, you know, help them find learning products and to book these courses and things like that. And he observed them using our internal tools and also the Mac, and he just noticed that they weren't using, or barely using keyboard shortcuts. Um, and he reasoned, given uh, an OKR that was active at the time, that you know, if they use them better, that would contribute in a very significant way to a particular key result that was, uh, you know, that we wanted to achieve at that point. So he set up an internal training. It was a big hit, and um, yeah, see, he felt attention and acted on it, and that's that's perfect. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope this gave you some insight into how we consciously work towards um, shared objectives while maintaining a self-managing mindset. So to me. To me, it all feels quite normal, maybe also because I've been doing this for six years uh, or five, but I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying super obvious things. But what I do know is that we're doing our thing and it's working out quite well. So what you see here is a screenshot from uh, Tiny Pulse. It's a tool we use that it sends out uh, a weekly survey to each, uh, yeah, each employee. And each month it sends a question uh, or it asks you to rate your happiness from, from one to 10. And so the, the yellow line is Springest since 2014, you know, and it does quite well compared to what they measure on average. And since uh, 2016, we can actually segment by, the, by circle, so by the product circle, or let's say people whose main roles are in the product circle, and that's doing, you know, even a bit higher. So quite, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, so as for the future, what does it hold beyond cool stock photos? I'm not, I'm not sure, but as of yet, things have scaled uh, quite nicely, and the self-managing culture is strong at the core, and it's also relayed through conscious hiring and onboarding, which is really important as well. So I realize I'm, I'm being super positive here, and that's because mainly Holacracy for us has worked well. But there are companies who have tried and failed or are having a hard time. So one high-profile example is, is Medium, the blogging, uh, blogging company who started it and then stopped it some years later. Um, another one is uh, Zappos, the you know, American shoe company with a thousand plus employees who, you know, who get quite some negative press actually about their relentless adoption of, of Holacracy. Um, to be honest, I'd love to walk around there for a day and see, see how it is. Like I'm sure I'd recognize you know, maybe the mindset and the basic principles of how they you know, work, but I, I think it would be very different also. Um, because the thing is, like, Holacracy or any good self-management system is, isn't a pre-made structure for you to just implement. It's a set of rules that lets you evolve your own structure. Um, and, so if you, and if you follow these rules, whatever will come out will be unique to your organization. Um, so I want to close by making a, a drawing a parallel with the personal um, productivity uh, framework, uh, getting things done or method getting things done. Um, so it has apparently belt levels, <laughs> like something of a measure of how much Zen you have achieved, I think. And it says about the, the black belt level, it says you don't need to convince anyone about the methodology, you're usually not thinking about it, merely using it. And your review time regularly takes you down constructive rabbit trails of creative thinking, decision making, and idea generation. So. Imagine something similar for the organization. Uh, this, this doesn't happen all the time and we, for, for us, and it really have to work hard towards it. But occasionally, it can really feel like people are flowing like water, so to speak, through the organization. Um, you know, and Holacracy itself serving more as a, as a background process. Um, so as I said, way back in 2012, Holacracy was kind of thrown at us as developers. But we were on board to try it out. And um, it, it's paid off, like the, the politics and bullshitting are still nowhere to be found, and uh, clarity and purpose are our king. So one moment, uh, you know, a, a 
product, a member of the product circle can be working deeply, you know, coding on a difficult uh, development project, but another they can let go and energize a role, as they say, as we say, where they are helping colleagues learn keyboard shortcuts, or you know, they can be cheersing colleagues for nice work, nice teamwork that they did together, or um, yeah, or organizing hack days, or even hammering on cabinets and in the office. <laughs> you know, so, well, thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Um, I'm impressed by all the details and how uh, it's organized. Um, I work uh, in a company, we do also circles, but we don't have much rules. Mm -hmm. It's very different from what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I, I had some questions. Um, um, how do you onboard peop new people? How do we, sorry? How do you onboard new people? New people uh, from the... Yeah, uh, extensively. <laughs> that has also definitely uh, evolved over time, but um, let's say let's let's see what currently what is you know so some roles in that whole structure. There is an uh, we have uh, one circle that that is called the smooth operations circle, um, and in that that circle you have a whole bunch of roles to do with yeah, you know making other people at Spring uh, be happy and work well. And in that circle, there's a, a role called onboarding, for sure. And that's um, that role also maintains, let's say, another type of template with a whole bunch of things that we, you know, a, a project that we give to new hires in their first on their first day, with all these sorts of tasks like you know, watching some in, we, um, you know, setting all things ranging from setting up. Uh, you know, your account for all these sorts of uh, tools that we use, uh, but also uh, watching internal, you know, videos of um, internal trainings that we gave and then recorded about w how the history goes in this and this circle and, yeah, and okay, the product. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have this as well. Also, a lot of internal sessions, uh, yeah. about a month, different internal sessions about the culture. Yeah, so exactly. It, take it, it takes quite some time. Uh, it, ta we it does. Noticed. It does so. This, this, you know, we've we've started. That's evolved in the past two, three years for sure. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, cool. Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering how how resource allocation works, especially human resources. Human resource. Uh, human. Well, yeah. Yeah. You have self-managing teams, and people choose their own roles. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you have to tell probably someone to join your team. Yeah. Or not? How does that work in a holacracy? Yeah, so mostly when you, uh, I don't know, when you put out vacancies and when you hire, you have a particular role in mind, one that often exists already. And, you know, when, when someone gets onboarded into the company, as I said, they, they go through this, this, you know, a small onboarding phase, but basically then it is up to a lead link of a circle to uh, assign a role to someone or let's say ask them if they want to fill a role. Um, it's kind of as simple as that. You accept the role, you can also reject it. But if you started a company, maybe it's not a good idea to reject the first role that you're, you know, <laughs> given. Um, yeah, there's there's not that much behind it. Like HR, we don't have, let's say, an HR department. But maybe the smooth operation circle comes closest. There are processes in in, in place, uh, you know, for for hiring and and recruiting and va and vacancies and all sorts sorts of things. Yeah. I don't know if that maybe answered something. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, first, thank you so much for the presentation. According to your experience, what size of, uh, what's the best organization size to start using uh, mm. Holacracy? Yeah, probably, uh, I'm guessing it's not a coincidence that it, that it worked well for us and we were started at about 15 or 20. So it doesn't really make sense to do this sort of thing when you're like, well, uh, not true, but like at three or four people, you know, it, it can still work out with, with chaos. But even there, starting to map out whatever, you know, accountabilities there are implicitly can already help you in the long run. Um, there are definitely bigger companies trying it out, big companies of like hundreds of people and trying it out. We have, we are active in like the, let's say, me, um, yeah, meetup community for Holacracy. Uh, if you're interested, we, we host events for that also. And there's 
yeah, always uh, people coming by from some companies with a couple hundred people trying to find ways to implement this. But the, t the core thing is, it's very important that the, let's say the CEO or the, the executive or founder or whatever signs off on it, or more, not sign off, let's say, supports it fully. And what it worked for us is that he was the one who found it and implemented it and wanted it to, to work, you know? And that's sometimes tough for these other companies where, you know, someone from maybe development found out about it and, and their whole department is interested, but they're trying to have to convince management or something, and then it can be tougher. But there's definitely all sorts of uh, experiences in the community that, that people can share and learn from each other, maybe. Yeah. That's it? All right. Thank you for your questions as well and for your attention. Yeah. <laughs>